Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, alpha channels and transparency. So RGBA is a is a format which adds an, an alpha channel which holds the opacity information or transparency information. The usual representation is that zero means that a pixel is transparent and 255 means the pixel is, is opaque and some number in between that is uh, representing a, a partially transparent pixel. So you can see that if we wanted to blend these two objects together that we would have to have some mathematical approach to how you're going to to blend those colors to get to get the final colors to work out what that that color is in the middle for example there and there's some maths for doing that and the output alpha of a pixel in, in the middle of that, that blend will be a, a function of the source alpha and the destination alpha. And we're, and we're thinking here in terms of the alpha being a 0, 0.0 up to 1.0. So they're, they're floating point numbers. So essentially you, you multiply the destination alpha by uh, 1 minus the, the source alpha and then add, add on the source alpha. The output RGB value is this combination of things. For each channel, so this, so this is for each channel, what we're going to have to do is um, get the source and then add on, it's the source color times the source alpha, and then it's in the adding on the destination color times the destination alpha times the inverse, um, of the one, one minus the source alpha. So you get, you get a component from both the source and the destination, and then you um, divide it by this this final result uh, for, for the, um, the output alpha. Just, just looking at a simple case here, if the destination is completely opaque, so you're drawing something partially transparent over an opaque destination, then we can set the destination uh, alpha to be 1, and this is what the, the above equations uh, reduce to. You can see that it's essentially a, a kind of weighted average between the source and the source alpha and the destination times 1 minus that source alpha. So if the source was completely opaque, that would mean this source A value is 1, and this value over here will um, become 0. So you end up ignoring the destination pixels and just completely overwriting them. All right. So you can see in this, these equations here that um, you're having to do multiplications for each, each color channel and for each pixel, which can be expensive. So there's another thing called pre-multiplied alpha, where these multiplications that are happening can actually be determined in advance. We know that for a given pixel, we already know what the source red and green and blue values are, and we already know what the source alpha is at that pixel as well. So we could actually just multiply those red, green, and blue channels by the alpha at that, at that pixel and store that into our image instead of having to store the alpha and, and do all these multiplies at runtime. And so that's what's called a pre-multiplied alpha image, where we've, we've already done some of the computation that will be needed uh, in order to do some al alpha compositing. And now what that means is that in the image, uh, in the file format, we won't have any red, green, or blue value in, in the color channels that are greater than the alpha for a given pixel, because we've already multiplied it by the alpha. So the alpha value from 0 to 255 will represent a number from 0 to 1.0, and so everything will have to be scaled by that number. So if you're looking at it, an image which has pre-multiplied alpha, it won't always be obvious. That might, may not have been recorded into the image file format, uh, but this, will be, this is a heuristic that you could use to see, has someone already done pre-multiplied pre -multiplied the alpha on this particular image? Last point here is that you've actually lost some information here. You, you're, if you've got 50% alpha, you've actually scaled all your, all your red, green, and blue values down, or, and you've lost a, a, a bit from every one of those, those values. So um, you do lose, you know, this is lossy, but it does save you, save you time. All right, I'll talk about gamma correction. So this is a power law that controls luminance and RGB values. It's optimized to, it optimizes the bit encoding. 
we, we tend not to be able to see so much detail in, in low light situations. So when we have very dark images, you don't actually need to store so many bits to represent that. So the idea of uh, gamma correction is that you make the brighter uh, colors, you give them effectively more bits to represent those bright colors. So there's, we can see more gradations in the, in the brightness at the, at the higher end of how um, a, a color channel is, is represented. And at the low end, we, we can actually have quite broad gradations in the, in the, in the, in the, in the color. Gamma is often set to 0.45 when you're encoding. Basically, we, you have broader steps between the, the dark colors and you get more information at, at, the, at the high end. Um, you might actually be able to see this kind of thing in, um, in movies when there's very dark uh, scenes uh, or, if, for example, if there's a sunrise, you can often see banding in, the, in, in sunrise or um, if there's a, there's a fade in to a scene. Sometimes you can see these, these visible bands occurring. It's because of this kind of thing. They're actually st deliberately storing less information in the low light scenes. And basically, so you, to encode it, you, you, you encode this way, you, you're actually losing a bit of information that way, but then to display it, then essentially they perform this inverse operation to actually get it back to a, a more linear display for, 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 your, um, for your screen. That's something to know about just because... If we, if we do any sort of color correction, you can end up losing information by doing this kind of transformation. Okay, another thing to be aware of is something called half toning or dithering. And this is a way to fake more colors by interleaving different colors. And it was um, used in the, in the printing industry. You can see that Superman's hand there is actually a, a combination of red and white. So it's just by spacing the red dots out there, you've got this combination of colors that, that looks pink from a distance. And this kind of thing happens often in, um, in GIF images. If you see GIF images uh, online, uh, GIF can only represent 256 colors in any one image. So they, they tend to do this kind of dithering in those images. So I'll talk about the GIF, um, GIF format quickly. It only encodes up to eight bits per pixel. So it can only encode 256 colors. So it's a, it's a very poor representation of color, and that's why they used uh, dithering. So this sort of image down here, you can, you can see the colors are only sort of approximate. Doesn't, it doesn't smoothly go between the different colors because it, can't, it just can't represent that many colors. Uh, it's RGB only. You can make one color transparent if you want. So it's, it's a fairly primitive kind of thing, but of course it does animation, which is why it's still around. Another format is TIFF, and TIFF is a, is a format that encodes images into RGB strips. Um, baseline TIFF is 24 bits per pixel, but there are extensions which allow other kinds of representation of, of color. It can support palleted colors, so that's where you, you have a lookup table to, to work out what the colors are. And uh, there's actually a lot of extensions. The, one of the problems with this particular format is that there's lots of non-standard extensions. So if you've got a TIFF image, you've got to know what kind of TIFF image you've got and what kind of extension, what, what extensions are, are supported. There is a baseline, but there's all these extra, extra things that can be done, including um, run length encoding and lossless LZW and so on. Uh, it's, complex, it's a complex format. Talk about PNG quickly. It is lossless, it's compressed, it's a chunk-based system, so you can, you can actually add these extra informational chunks into the format. And one of the chunks stores information about the gamma that's been used to encode the image, whereas other formats like GIF don't, are blissfully unaware of gamma. So there's no, actually no way to represent that information in GIF, but in PNG they've, they've, they've thought ahead and said, well, let's, let's allow all these different sorts of informational chunks that you can add in. Uh, there's lots of different bit formats that are big pixel depths that are allowed. There's palleted, there's grayscale, there's RGB, and there's RGBA formats, and also 16 bits per pixel, not just there's 24 bit per pixel, 32 bit per pixel. 16, uh, that's, sorry, that should say 16 bits per channel, not per pixel, sorry. Let's talk about JPEG now. So JPEG stores information using a thing called the discrete cosine transform, which is a lossy transform. You can see the cat on the left-hand side there, the, the, um, it's all pixelated, 
this this image is going from a low a low quality to a high quality across across the image there to show you what happens. I'm sure you've all seen that sort of pixelation. It's a block base, so it tends to be on eight by eight pixel blocks or sixteen by sixteen pixel blocks, and it uses gamma encoded pixels. There's lots of different kinds of artifacts that you've you're probably no doubt aware of. This is a ringing artifact where near the near an edge you can actually end up with just the way the maths works for the for the DCT transform. It ends up being just an approximation, which ends up giving you these strange sort of blocky artifacts. The JPEG encoding uh, uses a um, this, this zigzag scan uses a a DC coefficient and then 63 AC coefficients, and the low frequency information is stored first. This is basically the set of numbers that you need to reconstruct a particular block of pixels. So, so these numbers will be used basically to produce linear combinations of the, the patterns that are on the right to approximate the particular colour channel that you're trying to represent. And because the information is, is the low frequency information, which is the most important information, is in the top left there, what you do when you encode a JPEG image, when you reduce the quality, you're basically throwing information away from, from the bottom right. So if you want to reduce the quality of a JPEG image, you can just throw away some of these coefficients. But most, a lot of the, the high frequency data down the bottom, which doesn't matter so much, will get thrown away. But actually, because it doesn't matter so much, that's, that's quite okay. And that's why, we can, um, that's why it's very commonly used. It's lossy, but in a way that doesn't matter to, you know, too much. There's lots of different file formats. There's one called GIF, which is not used because it's too complex. There's one called JFIF, which is very commonly used. It's also called App, App Zero. Uh, and there's one called EXIF, which is used in, by a lot of modern camera manufacturers, and that's called App One, and it contains more uh, metadata, which of course can cause privacy issues because Information about uh, who you are or where you were when you took the photo is is actually in the images, and that can that can leak information. So, so there are different different file formats. 